Amen. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church on this beautiful, beautiful Memorial Day weekend. We are excited that God has brought you uh, to join with us on your phones or there on your tablets, on your computers, even on your televisions. We know we have folks joining in on all kinds of ways this morning. We want to thank you so much. Uh, for joining with us at Oklahoma City First United Methodist Church. We recognize during this season of, of primarily online worship and in this season of many churches that are already beginning uh, to meet for in-person worship, we know that you have lots of lots of opportunities. And so we want to thank you so much for joining with us online here at Oklahoma City First United Methodist Church. There in the video description there on YouTube, you will be able to find a link to our online bulletin. Or you can go to our, to our website and you can find the link to our online bulletin. In that on, on that uh, online bulletin, you will find a, uh, you'll find a connection card. We would love to be able to know who exactly is joining with us this morning. We see a number of your names there on, on the chat feature on, on YouTube, but there are a number of other folks that are joining in. And so if you're joining in, we would love to have a little bit of information uh, with you. If you are new to church or new to first church, we certainly want to welcome you on this Memorial Day on this Memorial Day weekend. We have some, um, also in that, in that uh, bulletin, you'll find some other things going on in the life of our church. Everything from our online Bible studies to other small groups that are gathering. Also some, uh, some information about our online Sunday school class that is continuing. We're doing everything that we can to, to remain connected uh, with one another here at First United Methodist Church. A couple of things that I want to share with you. One, uh, we would invite you to join um, on, um, on television today at 1230. And so just a few moments after, the, after our worship service is over today at 1230 on Channel 9, KWTV here in Oklahoma City, there is going to be a, a special program for Oklahoma United Methodist. It's called Hope in the Heartland. And on that TV program, there will be stories of, of uh, inspiration that we have been experiencing as the United Methodist Church here in the state of Oklahoma. And so we hope and pray that you will join uh, watching together uh, that, that special, special program. Also, I wanted to let you know the latest on kind of where we are as a church. We recognize that there are a number of churches that have already opened back up for in-person worship. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, our, our bishop released a statement saying that uh, United Methodist churches are not to meet before June the 7th. And, but each church is supposed to uh, create a relaunch team. So here at First Church, we've created that relaunch team, and we've had our first meeting. And um, that, that team decided that First Church will not meet until at least after June 14th. Uh, we will be releasing another statement on June 15th and uh, around June 15th, and, and we'll let you know, uh, we'll hopefully have a more concrete date uh, at that point. Uh, we've recognized that um, just the feedback that we're getting from our congregants, uh, most of us are not quite ready to come back. Uh, likewise, the, uh, the guidelines that have been handed down from our annual conference are, are quite restrictive. Everything from everyone must wear masks at all times uh, to uh, you won't have an uh, you won't get to select where you sit in the in the sanctuary. You would have to be seated uh, by an usher in specific areas, uh, and then uh, you would not be able to converse with anyone else uh, before, during, or after worship. There would no be there would not be any interaction time with other folks and. Uh, they are strongly suggesting that no congregational singing take place at this point. And so we have felt that until those restrictions are, are lessened just a little bit, we're not quite ready to come back to in-person worship. But certainly, we can hardly wait for that day. I don't know, some of you may have noticed this, uh, this beard that I have been growing, this, uh, my, my coronavirus beard. I've, I've told my, I've kind of made the decision that I'm not going to shave this, this off until, um, at least until uh, we come back together for in-person worship. My wife is, at, she's absolutely begging for us to open up the church to in-person worship, primarily so I can shave, so I can shave this off. 
Well, on this Memorial Day weekend, we are indeed glad and, and excited that God has brought you here. Sean Walker has our opening prayer, and as, and, and as he is leading us in our opening prayer, I always want to remind you why we're here. Even, even during this season of social distancing, even during this weekend of remembering those who have died before us, today is Resurrection Day. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunities to be able to meet virtually this morning. Father, to praise and to worship you, Lord, to hear your word, Father. Father, I pray that you'll just be with us right now as we're in this time of pandemic, that you will just give us uh, peace, that you'll put up a hedge of protection around us, Lord, as we uh, have sickness that's around us, Lord, that you'll just help us not to be scared. Help us just to have strength and take strength in you, Lord. Uh, your word says to seek you and seek you above all else, and I pray that we will do that, Lord. I pray that you'll just be with the first responders and the doctors and the researchers that are dealing with this pandemic right now, that you'll just give them wisdom. Help them just to uh, have rest, Father, have strength as they're dealing with this, Lord. Be with our, our leaders in our country, in our state, our city, Father. I pray that you'll just give them wisdom, that they will seek godly counsel, Father. Father, I pray that you'll just bring about revival in this time, Father. People are hungry, Father. People are just scared and, and needing comfort, Lord, and only you can do that, Father. And so I pray that they will just seek you, Father, that you'll just, just continue knocking on the doors of their hearts and their minds, Lord, and that they will just open them up and just come to you, Lord. And just bring about revival, Lord, at this time, Father. Be with Pastor Leslie and the worship team this morning as they are leading us, Father. I pray that the Holy Spirit will flow through them. The Holy Spirit will flow through us, Lord, as we are worshiping you and praising you in our houses, Father. And we just thank you so much. In your Son, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please join me in singing, O oh God, our help in ages past. Now let's take a few moments now to greet one another in the name and in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Take an opportunity there to use that chat feature on our YouTube channel or go ahead and text some folks, call some folks, 
uh, go ahead and connect with some others, especially those that you know or have not been able to connect with us yet, or maybe some folks that you've been missing either here in the life of our church or maybe some relatives or maybe even uh, some friends and co-workers. Connect with one, an one another now here for just the few, next few moments. As we come back together, you're invited to join uh, your voices and your hearts together as we join together in affirming our faith. Let's join our hearts and our voices together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who is common Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. As we continue to respond to God's love and grace in our lives. It's time now uh, for us to offer God our lives and our livelihoods. Once again, I want to thank you so much for your generosity during this very trying season, during this season of, of financial insecurity, during this season of, uh, of social distancing and not being able to be here, uh, physically be here at the church. You have responded so faithfully. We want to let you know that we are continuing our ministries to those, especially those who are experiencing incredible poverty here in, in downtown Oklahoma City. We are, um, although we are, we're not, um, we're, we're not having our in-person Friday night live, uh, we are sending all of those funds that we would normally spend on, on feeding the downtown homeless. We are sending those to the Homeless Alliance, one of our partner agencies. And there are so many other ways that we're reaching out uh, to our community as well. I also want to let you know that we're part of, um, uh, of Meals on Wheels here at First Church. Many of you are not, aw not aware of that. Uh, our site is one of those sites that we are pre uh, packaging those meals. Um, that is run through St. Luke's United Methodist Church, our, our partner church, and our, our chef here at, at First Church is preparing many of those meals. And so you continue to be in ministry to those who are in significant, significant need. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you bow with me? Oh God, we thank you for the great love that you, that, that you have offered to us in Jesus Christ. God, we want others to come to know you as a loving God. And so often is the case, we, we find that people are unable to hear the gospel when they have an empty stomach. So God, we pray that we as a church would continue to reach out to those who are experiencing intense poverty. We pray as well that, that we would do everything that we can to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Through these gifts and these tithes and these offerings, Lord, help empower us to do that as a church. Now bless these gifts, bless the giver, multiply these gifts for, your, for, you, for the use in your kingdom. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made i see the stars i hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the 
universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my Amen. It's time now for our children's message. If our kids would gather around your TV screens or there in front of whatever screen you're watching on this morning, we would love to have, have our kids gather around us. We know that this is a trying time for our children, and Miss Kendall has a special word for our children this morning. Good morning, First Church. It's time once again for our children's message. So kids... Let's gather around. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, it basically says, Why do you point out the speck? Or some translations say, Why do you point out the splinter in your neighbor's eye and neglect or forget to realize the log in your own? And I think that's a pretty powerful message to hear. You know, we are all so different. And so it's quick to recognize someone else's flaws and to you know be quick to judge others because it's hard for us to really recognize and see our own shortcomings and so it's important to remember how we would want to be treated in that situation you know we would want people to speak kindly to us to pray for us and that's exactly what god calls us to do so instead of judging one another we need to uplift one another amen will you pray with me Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, I pray that we won't be quick to recognize our neighbor's own shortcomings or flaws, Lord, but whether we will be uplifting, Lord, and speak words of kindness to them, pray for them, and just help build each other up, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bye, guys. fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him, we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? 
did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war and bravely faced them, certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one, that he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, we simply say with pride, thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms. As we go to the Lord in prayer on this Memorial Day weekend, there are indeed a number of folks that we need to be remembering and, and praying for. Certainly on this day, we uh, are honoring and remembering those who have gone before us, especially our veterans. And uh, I just think back on my almost 23 years of ministry and remember um, all of those that I have, pres all, all of those funerals that I have presided over that were uh, service men and women, and um, I remember I remember those in, uh, in incredible relationships with um, with great joy, and uh, also on on this weekend we remember we remember their sacrifice. So we would be uh, ask, we would ask that you would remember the families of of those who uh, are our veterans, especially those who have gone before us, and likewise this weekend is a weekend in which uh, many people are out visiting cemeteries and putting flowers on not just the, the graves of our, of our veterans, but also upon um, all family members. And I look forward to doing that with my own family this weekend. And so we need to be uh, remembering others, who, especially those who have, who have lost loved ones recently, and those that are continuing in mourning. There are some folks here in the life of our church that we would ask that you would join with us in prayer. Um, we got word uh, just this week that Sarah Fisher's grandmother passed away. We need to be praying for Sarah and her family. Uh, continue to be praying for um, Cindy Jenka's mother. She is recovering from, uh, from some procedures and ongoing treatments. Uh, need to be praying for Kelly and Pat. And we have so many others in the life of our church. We, as always, throughout this, uh, throughout this um, epidemic, we would ask that you would join with us in praying, especially for those in the medical profession, those that are putting themselves in harm's way. Our prayer time will begin with a time of quiet, quiet prayer, followed by a time of some guided prayer and meditation. You'll have an opportunity where you are to speak aloud those names that are weighing heavy on your heart. You're even... Uh, please feel free as well to, to simply uh, send those out on the chat or, or even, even um, you're, you're welcome to even text those to me as well. I would appreciate seeing those names. And then we'll have a call and response that will be on our screen. And then finally, our prayer time will conclude with the Lord's Prayer that also will be on our screens. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of life, we come before you because you are a God of life and we worship you because you and you and, on, you and only you are worthy of our worship and praise. 
That's why we have gathered together. Because you and only you are worthy of our worship and praise. And God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we pause now to remember those who have gone before us, especially those who have, who have made such sacrifices for this country. Those families that said goodbye to loved ones. Those fellow soldiers that watch lives slip away right in front of them. And more generally, O oh Lord, we, we come as those who continue in mourning for our loved ones, our family members and friends who have gone before us. As we spend some time this weekend reflecting on Well, re reflecting on the, the brevity of life, we recognize that, that your love is never-ending. For as our, our lives are finite, your love is infinite. Your grace is infinite. Your salvation is infinite. And so as we come to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we are relying upon your grace and your love for us. And God, we know so many who are in desperate need of, of more grace, more love. We've already mentioned so many names, but we have so many others weighing on our hearts and minds on this day. We lift them up to you now, O oh Lord. Hear these, our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And as always, O oh Lord, we know that you have heard our prayers and you are answering our prayers. And you're doing that in your time and in your manner. God, on this day, we pray for miracles. We pray for you to, to intervene on our behalf. Help us to be part of your plan of healing and peace and grace in this world. And we pray all of these things through Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, right where you are, you're invited to lift your voice and lift your song as we just continue to pour out our love back to him. to come so open the gates and let your glory come down open our hearts and let our worship pour out oh your presence your presence here is all we need you break our chains with sounds of victory Changing everything so open.
you come and remind us of your presence, remind us that you are Lord, God we fix our eyes on you, we fix our eyes on you Jesus, I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in
Lord, you are worthy. We praise your holy and everlasting name. We, we get this sense that, that you delight in our love for you. We, you delight when we, when we lift your name upon high. We, you delight when, when we say, great is your name. You are the greatest, the most glorious, the most awesome. We know as we proclaim your praises, as we join together and bow before you and worship before you, we are surrounded by the great saints of heaven. We are surrounded by the angel armies right where we are. Come, Holy Spirit. Come into our midst. We know O oh, Spirit, that you dwell inside of us. But we invite you into our we invite you into our homes. We invite you. We invite you right where we are to come and speak to us, to come and to, to come and dwell among us, to come and change us and transform us. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us each and every one of us. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes out of Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 33 through 37. Rachel Shepherd is, uh, will be reading our scripture for us uh, this morning. Again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me? Oh God, we thank you for this, your word. And make this your word be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. Now God, hide me behind your cross that your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I grew up with a, with a kid who lied. I mean, he lied about, about ev everything. It didn't matter what it was. How many points he had in a basketball game, how many turkeys he saw that morning while he was, while he was hunting, how big that fish was that he caught. He lied all the time, even about things that didn't matter at all. He would even lie about things that didn't even necessarily make him look better. Your word is your bond. That was what I was taught when I was growing up. But that's not what our culture tells us. Talk is cheap. We, we live in a culture in which the truth is often the very first casualty uh, between interactions between people. Online inter interaction? We'll post a story making your life seem like something out of a storybook. Uh, social media, uh, a selfie on social media, get just the right angle. I've, I've found the, the angle right up here, kind of from a side, it, 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 it hides those, those extra chins that, that we have. It hides that roll above our waistline as well. A business deal? Hire an elaborate team of lawyers to pour over the contracts and notaries and binding signatures to ensure that everything, everyone will do what they will say that they do. But no amount of lawyers make people more truthful. That's what I found. No amount of lawyers can make people more truthful. In fact, most people in our culture don't even believe that truth is an objective reality. They don't believe in an absolute truth or a moral truth. Everything is relative, even, even truth. The phrase, my truth, 
has made its way into our everyday conversations. I'm just speaking my truth now, people say, as if everyone's truth is different, Every, as if everyone has a different truth. Today we're continuing our sermon series on the greatest sermon ever. Now again, I don't, I don't want you to be confused at all. I am in no way saying that any of the sermons that I'm preaching is the best sermon ever. What we're examining, however, is the best sermon ever, and that is the Sermon on the Mount by, by Jesus. Uh, in this Sermon on the Mount, we, we began by looking at the Beatitudes, those, those statements of Jesus, those, those blessings of Jesus that turned everything upside down. Oh, the blessedness of being in mourning. Oh, oh, the blessedness of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Oh, the blessedness, the blessedness of being persecuted. They don't make sense. But what we found were that these are statements that God is saying, where I reign and where I rule, where I am present, he is saying, this is what happens. Where God is present, the, 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 the poor in spirit are, are blessed. Where God is present, those who are mourning are, are, are blessed. Where God is present, the world is turned upside down. And then last week, we, we examined forgiveness and the, and the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an option for Christians. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, just as you received forgiveness, we must, absolutely must, extend that same kind of forgiveness to others. And so today we are turning our attention, turning our attention to our lying lips in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, the, again, the, the best sermon ever, seems a little bit anticlimactic. And Jesus has just fi finished teaching on murder and adultery and eye-plucking and hand-lopping. This doesn't seem to be a particularly good place to, to follow such dramatic actions with a discussion of oaths and vows. It doesn't make sense. But I suggest this issue that Jesus is addressing here goes to the very core of a person's character, to the heart of, of what it means to live as a child of God. As, as Jesus taught, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles a person. So the words that we use and what comes out of our mouth really begins to show what's in our heart. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about the importance of honesty and integrity in all that we say and all that we do. This teaching of Jesus has often been, been misunderstood and, and I think even misapplied in my estimation. Some have interpreted this scripture to be a prohibition against taking oaths, all oaths. That's why some Christian sects won't, they won't uh, take an oath in a court proceeding or recite the Pledge of Allegiance. They feel that these words of Jesus prohibit such modern oaths, but I think upon further study that Jesus is, is talking about something quite dramatically different. This passage, this passage here, verses uh, 33 through uh, 37, uh, they follow the, the same pattern. This section follows the exact same pattern as the previous three or four sections. In each case, Jesus states an old covenant law, points out how the scribes and Pharisees have restricted or misinterpreted that law, and then goes on and tells the real meaning of that law. He gets to the very heart of the law. In this case, Jesus presents a summary of several Old Testament commands related to the taking of oaths. For example, if we, if we, as we read in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, it says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And so, one of the ways we can break the, the third commandment, you shall not miss the, misuse the name of the Lord your God, is when we swear falsely by God's name. 
And so Jesus is taking a, a number of these old covenant laws and he's uh, cond condensing, condensing them and, and speaking upon them. Or, or we read in Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to, ob to obligate himself by a pledge, pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. And so the Old Testament says that we must, we must not make any oaths in God's name that, that are either not true or that we do not intend to keep. We must not make any oaths in the name of God if, we are, if, if they're not true or we don't intend to keep that oath. Now, there was nothing wrong about this teaching itself. In fact, as followers of Christ, we would, we would affirm these old covenant teachings. Remember, Jesus upheld the authority of the, of the entire Old Testament when he said, I have come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. The problem was that just as it was with murder and adultery, the Pharisees were reinterpreting the law to find a way out. It wasn't that, that the Old Testament commands, were there, there were problems with them, but the Pharisees were searching for, for legal loopholes, and they, they were trying to manipulate these, um, well, in this instance, they were trying to manipulate this rule on oaths in, in order to deceive others. Stick with me now. I, I, I think this is fascinating. Just, just stick with me here for a few minutes, because I... I think this is an important lesson that we often will especially overlook when it comes to this passage of Scripture. And now in the Old Testament, when you swore by someone, so oftentimes someone would swear by another person, you were invoking that person first as a corroborating witness to attest your words. And so if you swore by someone, you were saying that um, they, would, they would corroborate what you have just said is truth, but second, second, you were, um, you, you were invoking that person as a judge against you if your words turn out to be false. And so if you use someone's name in an oath, again, you are, um, you are saying that they are a corroborating witness to attest to your words, and second, that, that you are invoking a judge against you and for that person to be your judge if your words were found to be untrue. Indeed, as we have seen, the law said that God's people were to swear by Him alone. Not by any other God. Not by any other created thing. So when they swore an oath to God or used God's name, they were saying that they were, it was so true that God was their corroborating witness that would attest what they said was true, and, and they were saying, if it's not true, God is going to be my judge. But the religious leaders in Jesus' day had trouble with telling the truth constantly, just like you and I do. So in order to guard themselves against being found guilty of swearing falsely by the name of God, it seemed that they had firmly established the habit of swearing by everything except God. They wanted to add some sort of force to their promise to make their words more credible, but they didn't want to incur the judgment of God by swearing something in His name when they didn't fully intend to make good on it or when it was not entirely true. So they created what was, in effect, a lesser class, class of oaths. Oaths that were bound to various parts of God's creation rather than to God himself. As Jesus' words in Matthew chapter, again, our passage that we read in chapter 5 pointed out, instead of swearing by God, they swore by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or even by their own heads. Apparently, it got pretty silly, the levels that these Pharisees and religious leaders went to. Oaths became more like contests who could, to see who could bind the most impressive object to a statement to give it the, the greatest force. Listen here to these words in, in Matthew chapter 23, when Jesus begins to show how absurd they had all become. Hear these words from Matthew chapter 20, 23. 
Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. And so, and so for the religious leaders, it had become a, a, a significant game to them. How can I trick you into thinking that I'm telling the truth when I'm, when I'm really not? It's almost as if the Pharisees were using the modern phrase, I'm just speaking my truth. <laughs> Jesus sums up the command to his followers by telling them not to swear an oath at all, but simply, but simply to let your yes be yes and your no be be no. Now, now hear me now. Remember who Jesus is primarily speaking to. In the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, it says his disciples gathered around him and he began to speak to him and, uh, and speak to them and then all uh, uh, other crowds began to, to listen in as well. It appears as though Jesus is primarily speaking to his most faithful followers and and he is explaining what the kingdom of God is like. Now, now again, um, recognizing that, that some of these things are a reality, but also some of them are also maybe things that we can look for, for the, to the, in the future. And so as, as Jesus, I think, is challenging his followers, you, you, and, you and me, I, I, think, I think he's telling us that Indeed, we're not, you're not perfect yet, but if, if you want to be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, as, as we've looked at already in chapter 3, then you'll do these things. If you want to be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, then, then you'll do these things. Your yes will be yes, and your, and your no, will be, no will be no. Now again, this is all very basic things that we all learned in kindergarten but in our culture but in our culture when each of us is simply speaking our truth i'm not convinced i'm not convinced this is quite so basic anymore likewise i i i, I found those who are those people who are people pleasers often struggle with truthfulness sometimes it's a it's a personality trait sometimes there are things that are buried way deep down inside of us that that kind of keeps us from being completely truthful i i, I want to give you I'll, I'll just be honest i, I want i want to give you some some preachy kinds of directions for you i want to give you some preachy kinds of directions for you the the first one the first one is simply to be truthful in your speech. Be truthful in your speech. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men and women, I might add, who are truthful. There's something incredibly sacred about being truthful. That means no lying, no exaggerating, no distorting, no shading the truth. No matter, no matter what your reasoning is, no matter it's because maybe you want people to like you better, maybe it's because you want to please others, maybe you're wired to be a people pleaser, maybe, maybe whatever, 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 whatever the reason. Speaking the truth is absolutely necessary for trust. And speaking the truth begin, brings great freedom to our lives. Thomas Fuller wrote, If I speak what is false, I must answer for it. If truth, it will answer for me. Commit yourself to speaking the truth at all times, and, and I have found it will absolutely revolutionize your life. 
the, the second suggestion that I would have for you is be careful what you promise. Be careful what you promise. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. God is always witness to what you say, so you need to be careful about what you promise. Now, um, I have friends. <laughs> I, I have friends that uh, they just they have a really hard time with saying no. So am I going to see you tomorrow? Well, yeah, maybe. I've got friends, when they say maybe, I know they mean absolutely not. And I continue to push them. I continue to push them to have the freedom to say no. It's okay to say no. Some of you may remember a, a sermon that I preached. I don't know. I think it was about a year and a half or so ago that I encourage you to, to begin to have the courage to say no to some things so that you can say yes to things that are even better. There's some things that we need to say no to, and we, we need to be emphatic when we say no. If there are things that we can't promise to, don't promise them. Don't lead people on instead. Instead, as Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your, and your no be no. And then finally, finally again, this is, this is incredibly simple, but in our culture, I, I, think, it's, I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's more rare. I think it's more rare than that. We can maybe go to, our, to my next slide. Uh, be faithful. Be faithful in following through. Be faithful in following through. Psalm 15 says, He who walks, he, he's, he whose walk is blameless, who speaks the truth from his heart, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, he who does these things will never be shaken. Be faithful in, in following through. When you, when you say that you're going to do something, do it. Be a person of your word. Speak the truth from, from your heart. And, and once you've given your word, be faithful in following through, even when, it, even when it hurts. Did you say yes? Then, then make sure you, you follow through with yes. Did you say no? Then make sure you follow through with, with no. That's what it means to, to let your yes be yes and your, and your no be no. Be people of truth. Be people of honor. Be people of integrity. Now, now again, this is, this is not necessarily a, 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 a message that's kind of a do-better sermon. That, that's not what this is. What this is, it's a picture of the kingdom of God. You see, when God reigns in our hearts, when God rules in our communities, when, when, when God is king of our church, this is simply how we act. This is simply how we act people of our word our yes is yes and our and our no is no we don't need to add any more force than that people trust us because we're people of our word wouldn't it be amazing wouldn't it be amazing that that if word began to spread around this community that you know those people at first church they're people of their word when they say yes they mean yes when they say no they mean no I wonder what it might be like for us to continue to create a community in which, in which we are people of our word. We're not speaking our truth. We're speaking the truth. We're letting our yes mean yes and our no mean no. Would you bow with me? God, we thank you for the amazing grace and love that we have found in Jesus Christ. Today, we, we've heard of what it means to, to live under your reign to live under your reign and, 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 how, and how as we live under your reign, we're called, to be, we're called to be truth speakers. Not just not just our truth, but the truth. The eternal truth of your word. The moral truth of, of, of your teachings. Lord, help our yes be yes and our no be no. God, I pray for especially those that, that sometimes struggle, sometimes struggle with truth-telling, 
trying to make themselves more than, than what they really are. Trying to, be more, trying to be someone that they're really not. God, come and convict us during this weekend in which many of us are going to be seeing some family members that we haven't seen in a while. Help us to speak the truth. Certainly speaking the truth in love, but letting our yes be yes and our no be no. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Go forth now as people speaking the truth, speaking about the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.